If you have osteoporosis, having a tool to identify fracture risk is really important. We want something that's gonna be non-invasive, something that's gonna be clinically relevant, but we know that there's problems with the current imaging modalities, right? So DEXA only measures bone density, it doesn't measure quality, and there's quite a bit of variation from scan to scan. REMS, which is the ultrasound device, is potentially gonna be better, still being proven, but it tells us both about density and quality. So it seems like a better study, except that it's not globally available. So not everybody has access to the REMS. What if there were another tool? What if there were another way that could potentially help us to identify fracture risk in addition to the imaging that we have? So there's a company called Ascentia, which has created a product and a test that may actually help us to do this. So what we're gonna talk about in this video is what is this test? How does it work? What does the literature show regarding this technology and how we plan on using it moving forward? All right, so what is this technology? Well, it's called spectroscopy and specifically this type of spectroscopy called Raman. I might be saying that wrong, but R-A-M-A-N spectroscopy. This is a laser-based technique that can look at the composition of bones specifically, comparing the mineral component to the organic component like collagen. Ausentia took this technology and moved it from bones to fingernails. So it's actually looking at the protein structure of keratin in the nails. And in theory, keratin shares a trajectory with bone health and changes in the nails can reflect changes in the bone. So it's kind of cool. If you go to their website, which is a UK based company, you can see the test and you can order the kit and it costs 79 pounds. But the science tab only leads to some short blogs and they don't link to any studies, but there are some studies. So I wanna go through these with you so you can understand our recommendation around this test. Before I get to that though, if you're struggling to put together your own bone health plan and you're trying to find the pieces of the plan that's gonna to work to, for you to improve your bone health, if you haven't been to our masterclass, please consider coming to it, totally free. It's an opportunity for us to talk about the myths and misconceptions that we see around bone health journeys for people that are, are coming into our program or in our community. And I wanna share these with you because it can really help to time collapse your journey in finding all this content to help find your own program. So link in the description on YouTube, see us in the masterclass, help clarify some things for you. So this first study is looking at human fingernail clippings. And they did this in comparison to taking drugs for bone health, as well as controls who weren't on drugs. And what they were able to show in this study is that the spectroscopy could determine one group from the other with what they say is confidence. So it looks like bone drugs do have an impact on keratin in a positive manner, I'll explain that in a minute, but they do have an impact on keratin similarly to the impact that you would expect to see on bone. And the spectroscopy tool technology was able to differentiate between people who were on bone drugs and people who were not. So, okay, that's cool. So to understand the power of this, we need to understand what the technology showed in animal models. So we're going to go back to looking at bone through the spectroscopy uh, technology. And so the second study looked at rats who'd had their ovaries removed. So they were forced into a menopause like state, and then they were given either Fosamax, uh, pulse parathyroid hormone or estrogen. And then they used CT to confirm what was happening in the bone. And then they also looked at the, the spectroscopy to see what was happening from that technology's perspective. And they made some interesting comments in here that I wanna share because I think it's, it's good to compare these things from a different perspective because these are different drugs that are gonna have an impact on bone and we're looking at it from a different way. So this study is actually cool in a couple ways. So first of all, they noticed that in the parathyroid uh, pulsed treatment. So again, Forteo, Temlos. In the parathyroid treatment, there were some macro, so big level structural changes that seem to be unrelated to the removal of the ovaries. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because we know that parathyroid hormone when pulsed is going to increase bone metabolism and it's going to have a positive impact on the bone building as well as potentially bone breakdown. And so the spectroscopy was able to pick up on that and it looked different than the bisphosphonate drug. Now the bisphosphonate drug, they say that it quote unquote protected the bone from the changes that you would expect from uh, removing the ovaries. But the question I have here is if the bisphosphonate drugs are the drugs that are going to poison the osteoclast and prevent bone turnover, are we quote unquote protecting the bone or are we simply just shutting down bone metabolism in failing to let the bone do what we expect it to do when you suddenly remove estrogen, especially surgically um, from the female system? So yes, 
the bisphosphonates nates will prevent those changes, but is that really what we want to do? And this study shows that, yes, it does prevent those changes, again, because it's shutting down bone metabolism altogether. Now, they go on to say that estrogen failed to prevent the biochemical changes as a result of removing the ovaries. Now, why would that be? It doesn't actually make sense to me that if the ovaries are producing estrogen and we give that estrogen back, that it would fail to prevent the changes that you would expect to see by removing them. But I think what's happening here is that the only reason why it would fail is that they just didn't dose it adequately. Now, to be fair, I don't know how to dose hormones for rats either, but if we were mimicking accurately the estrogen levels in a rat after removing the ovaries, we should see something similar as we do in humans, which is we can prevent that loss of, uh, of bone quality and quantity. So I think they probably just weren't dosing it right. But the end of the study really is about the spectroscopy. And so what they were able to say is that, yes, it was a predictive tool for monitoring pharmacologic therapy and osteoporosis in rats. But my question is, is, OK, so it can tell what you're on, which is great. But how good is it actually predicting what the drugs are doing? And again, is it going to actually predict fracture risk, which is ultimately what we care about? OK, so let's go back to human studies. So this 2018 study looking at nail clippings from the nurses health study. That's kind of interesting. I didn't know they did this, but they had nail clippings from participants in the nurses health study. And then, of course, this study went for decades. So they were able to follow them and actually look for fracture. So what was cool is that spectroscopy was able to tell the difference between the groups that had fracture and didn't have fracture based off of their nail clippings. That's neat, except that it might be kind of obvious because people that have had fractures, these women that have had fractures probably were at lower bone mineral density, probably had worse bone quality, which could have already been measured on another imaging modality like a DEXA or a REMS. So we don't really know how does this comparison compare to, say, just simply having a DEXA uh, or using a REMS. We don't actually know the answer to that. And that's an important point if we're going to use this as a screening tool. So this next study, study four, is actually an interesting, again, going back to animals, but an interesting rat study because it asked the question, how sensitive is spectroscopy at identifying, let's say, for example, in this study, a rat who's had their ovaries removed, how good is spectroscopy at identifying the changes that occur with that? Can they actually identify which rats went through the procedure and which rats went through a sham procedure? And what they found is that, yes, it could but only 90% of the time. In fact, they actually measured out uh, sensitivity and specificity, which means that if you have 90% of both, and it was around that for both sides, if you have 90% of both, that means that you have one out of 10 false positives and one out of 10 false negatives. So is that accurate enough? And again, how does it actually compare to DEXA, in, in this case, CT, which is what we usually use in rats? And it turns out that DEXA and CT are actually much more sensitive and, and specific when it comes to identifying rats that have gone through it, it removed ovary surgery. So it doesn't appear to be as good as the current imaging modalities that are available. So then there's two additional studies I'm not going to give you the details of because basically they just show that the, the keratin in fingernails looks different in those that have had fractures. But again, I think that this is probably relatively obvious. And then what do we actually do with it? Is it more sensitive and specific than DEXA and CT? No. If we're going to use these anyway, does it tell us anything additional? And we don't really know the answer to that. Should it be used instead of something like REMS? Absolutely not. It might be less expensive. It might be more readily available, but it doesn't help us to actually predict fracture. And that's what the REMS is so good about. Because of the fragility score, we're able to better predict future fracture. And ultimately, that's what we're trying to prevent. So in the end, is this something that we're going to use on a large scale? Certainly not in our practice, because all of our patients already have imaging modalities. Many of them have DEXA and they also have REMS. So I'm a big fan of the imaging that currently exists. Yes, I definitely want it to be better. But is adding this going to help with, say, a discrepancy between those two, if DEXA is bad or REMS is good? I don't think it's going to help make a difference because we don't know enough about the predictive quality of this test to be able to use it from a clinical perspective to change the way that we would otherwise be treating bone. So I hope that makes sense. So is there a future role? Maybe. I think it just needs more studies. We need to know what it means better to be able to use it clinically. I like the idea that it could be used at a mass scale for less money to identify fracture risk. I just don't think that we know what to do with it yet. So that's it on this one. I wouldn't waste your money. But remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.